Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the country of Yemen, its history, specifically who are the Houthis, a political and military group that emerged in Yemen in the 1990s, a group that President Joe Biden last week reclassified as a terrorist organization after the group attacked a number of ships, including U.S. warships. The Houthis claim it was aimed at ships that were associated with Israel's attack on Gaza. The United States has responded with its own military strikes against the Houthis, sparking fears of a wider conflict in the region. For this conversation, I'm joined by Shireen Al-Aldimi, who is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and Assistant Professor of Language and Literacy at Michigan State University's College of Education. Shireen Al-Aldimi, it is my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you, Mitch. It's good to be here. I appreciate you taking time to have this chat. We do want to dive into history. We'll also get to some of the more current things to get your perspective about that as well. Let me begin in the past, and I won't linger too long on ancient history, but just spending a little bit of time studying about Yemen, you quickly see that Yemen is an important place in history. It's important when it comes to Arab history. It's important when it comes to Arab identity and, and language. And it's also an important place when it comes to Islamic history. Yeah, um, it is. All of these things are true. Um, Yemen is, um, you know, we have a very long history, a long civilization. Um, the capital, Sana'a, is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Um, it's where the majority of, of in fact, the majority, most Arabs trace their roots back to Yemen, and so Yemenis are known as, you know, so to speak, the original Arabs. Um, if you're into coffee, Yemenis were the first to brew coffee that our Ethiopian brother and sisters um, discovered. And so we have a long, rich history, and even during the times of the Roman Empire, it was a key exporter of, um, you know, um, what is it, all of the spices and frankincense and myrrh, and so, um, it was known at a time by the Greeks and Romans as Arabia Felix for being this prosperous land. And so we have a long, long history and um, that, you know, Yemenis are very proud of. Um, but then it's kind of overshadowed by colonialism and the consequences of colonialism, as we know, are not just felt during that time, but they're generational. And so when we get into modern Yemeni history, things are a little bit more complicated. Yeah, it's, it's a place of empires. You mentioned the, the Romans and, and Greeks. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was there for a long time. They were replaced by, by the British Empire. What's the importance of, of, of that history of colonialism? So the Ottoman Empire ruled in what's commonly known as northern Yemen. Um, and, you know, they were on and off essentially from the 1500s until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1918. And they were met with fierce resistance throughout that history. Yemenis are not people who, you know, I don't think anybody likes to be subjugated. Um, and Yemenis have certainly fought very, very fiercely for their independence from the Ottoman Empire. And uh, so they left in 1918, and then they were replaced by um, a monarchy, a, a Yemeni a family of monarchists, the Mutawakkalite Kingdom, which lasted until the early 60s when there was a coup against a successful coup. They had attempted previous coups, uh, but this coup was successful in the 1960s to overthrow in the monarchy in favor of a republic. And so that's the history of northern Yemen. And in the south, we have the British Empire, first the East India Company and then the British um, themselves uh, were ruling the south of Yemen. Uh, from its center, Aden, where where I was born, um, for 128 years, and so it's a it's a long history of uh, partitioning the country essentially with the Ottomans in the north and the British in the south. Um, but South Yemen also gained its in independence through resistance in 1967, and uh, was then ruled by the Middle East's first and to date only. Marxist-Leninist country, and so it was a communist socialist country for a duration of time um, from the 60s up until 1990. Now, toward 1989, the Soviet Union was collapsing. Like I said, there aren't socialist countries in the region um, that could lend support to Yemen, and so the leaders in the South began to negotiate unity with the northern Yemenis. Um, and the country unified under 
President Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had already been ruling North Yemen from 1978 onwards. And so the idea of a greater Yemen always existed historically, and Yemenis living under the Ottomans, under monarchy, and living under the British Empire in the South always had the goal toward unity, which we finally saw happen in 1990, although it wasn't really, uh, many would say, successful unity, so to speak. How important is this dynamic of northern and, and southern Yemen in, in Yemen today? It's important because, um, like I said, it wasn't a very successful unity in the sense that within four years, the South declared secession from the North and was met with violent, you know, um, bombardment essentially by North Yemen. Um, and so there are all of these tensions brewing in the South of people wanting to have their independent Southern state, which you see up until this day. And fast forward to 2015, I mean, of course, a lot happened before then, and we can get into that. But in 2015, when the coalition that began bombing Yemen to reinstate the internationally recognized president to power, um, led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the United States, they found support among Southern Yemenis, or at least their leadership, who felt like, well, if you could help us, you know, against the Houthis, against Northern Yemenis, then we can maybe have our own independent state in the South. And so that dynamic is still important. And right now we see, like, and this has been the case since July of 2015, essentially, the historic North Yemen is controlled by who are known as the Houthis, the Ansarullah, and the historic South Yemen is controlled by this coalition, um, the Saudi-led coalition. They have their puppets in place, of course. Um, but, you know, the, we're back to that historic divide, essentially not perfectly, but more or less that historic divide between North and South. And it's also important to note that the North is a smaller geographical region, but it, it um, it's home to 80% of Yemenis, whereas the South is larger and has 20% of Yemenis. It's often described as a civil war occurring in Yemen. Is that an appropriate way to look at it? It's not, only because civil wars... Um, you know, there's agency in civil wars and may, there might be foreign interference, but there's agency among the parties. Whereas in the South, we've seen, or in Yemen, we've seen that there are the Houthis in the North who are um, fighting against the Saudi-led coalition. And the, you know, whether they're the separatists or they're the party of the Islamist party, the Islah, or the members of the ex-president's uh, group, the GPC, they've all joined forces with the coalition forces and without Saudi intervention, without Saudi backing and UAE backing, they would not form, they would not have the ability to form uh, a resistance against the Saudis or sorry, a, a resistance against the Houthis. And so the Yemenis are not, they're, they're fighting one another, but one group is being funded and backed and aided and, um, you know, in every way, shape or form by the Saudis and the United States and the UAE. And many of those people live in those countries and have called to war against their countries from those countries, from Saudi Arabia and from the UAE. Um, and so because of this extensive backing, because every bomb that was dropped on Yemen was a US made bombed, uh, you know, basically, you know, dropped on civilians in Yemen by the Saudis who received training and logistical support and targeting assistance and mid-air refueling by the United States. I think because of this overt and extensive interference by these countries, all of whom are foreign to Yemen, we can't really in good faith call this a civil war. The United States has also had a very direct role with, it, with its own bombing campaign in, in Yemen during the so-called war on terrorism. Right. And so... Um, starting with the Bush administration and the Obama administration, they, at the time, they had an ally in Yemen, President Saleh, their dictator and long-term ally, and he gave them free reign to do as they please in Yemen in the name of fighting terrorism. He enriched himself with, um, you know, funds from the U.S., essentially, to in the name of fighting terrorism. Uh, and he was a very, you know, savvy political maneuver maneuverer. And so... Um, Part of the reason that the Houthis came to power were because they were speaking out against this very relationship between our President Saleh and his relationship with the Saudis, his relationship with, with the United States, and uh, deteriorating the sovereignty of Yemen by allowing 
these presidents, these you know foreign uh, entities, to come and drop bombs on Yemenis as they see please, uh, as they please, as they see fit, as you know. Um, and we know that many, many civilians, if not most of the targets, have been civilians. But because the U.S. decided that a terrorist may have been amongst them, they were dropping these bombs on our people. And so this was there was a lot of resentment growing among the people in Yemen. But the Houthis were one of the groups who were speaking out against that. Ali Abdullah Saleh, you would describe him as a dictator? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he would won, win elections every five years by 99.9% of the vote. And so that's classic dictatorship. He would suppress his opponents, um, lots of political repression, lots of repression against intellectuals, anyone who would pose a threat, whether it was the Southerners in the South who were seeking secession or the Houthis in the North who were calling, out his, uh, for, calling him out for his corruption, he responded violently and through war campaigns. Um, but, you know, the U.S. loves its Middle Eastern dictators. And so he was propped up by the United States and by the Saudis for as long as he ruled, which is, ended up being 33 years. So a firm ally of, uh, to the United States. And Yemen's considered an ally at this per- during this period of time. Yes, until 2015 when he switched sides. Um, and so there's a lot of switching sides in Yemeni history. Yemenis are very, um, uh, let's say, pragmatic folks. And so um, former enemies turn allies, turn enemies again. This is a common story in Yemen. Um, but he he was deposed essentially in during the Arab Spring protests in 2011. He initially resisted and didn't give up power, but then he did after an assassination attempt. And um, he was able to negotiate a deal with that was overseen by the Gulf countries, the GCC, um, and was able to maintain in his power in Yemen step down, not face any prosecution, and he remained in charge of most of the Yemeni army. And so when the Houthis took over in 2014, um, they were only able to take over Sana'a because most likely he just had the army stand down and not pose any threat to them, and then became their political ally when they were, when the Saudis began bombing Yemen in 2015. So long-term enemy of the Houthis, they, he had waged six wars against them between 2004 and 2010, only to turn around and support them in their fight against the U.S. Saudi-led bombing, only to turn against them again in late 2017, and within 20, 48 hours, he was he was dead. So that's a bit complicated. Yeah. Um, and 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 so is this? How is it just? It's described frequently that the Houthis are largely in control of Yemen today, though maybe not entirely. But I'll I'll let you take that on. Um, is it through this process of him switching sides and then eventually his assassination that the Houthis really do gain? I, I guess the upper hand in Yemen, for lack of a better term. Yeah, so when um, the Houthis marched down from their province in Sada and took over in September of 2014, they were still interested in a political process. They were saying that they weren't, I mean, they used forest, of course, um, and you see that as a coup against the the president, the interim president at the time. They did place him under house arrest, um, but they were still willing and they were close to signing a UN negotiated peace agreement that would have formed a coalition government in Yemen. And Saudi Arabia was, of course, threatened by that outcome because they wanted the good old days where they had a puppet in Yemen's government. And they didn't want this coalition government that was going to include the Houthis, who are staunch uh, enemies of the of the Saudis. And so they interfered mi- militarily, uh, supposedly on behalf of the interim president of Yemen, but he was also caught by surprise and um, was happy to support them, of course, but he was caught by surprise. And... Um, The Houthis ended up forming this alliance with President Saleh, who mobilized much of the Yemeni army in their in their support uh, in support of the movement. Uh, And they were seen together as, you know, fighting against this invasion, this the Saudi led UAE part, you know, backed UAE, US uh, backed campaign. Um, They grew in power. They entrenched themselves in the in the capital. They formed a unity government with Saleh and members of his party. And they began governing the north, where, again, the majority of the population resides, while fighting the Saudis, you know, on the ground, or really their mercenaries on the ground. Um, When Saleh switched sides in late 2017, I think this was due to the UAE essentially speaking, you know, opening up a back channel with Saleh and saying, we're going to support you, you could be the president again, whatnot. And so he asked people to rise up against the Houthis, but it was a massive miscalculation because by then they were already um, 
in his own stronghold and he it was it was no longer a Saleh stronghold in Sana'a it was now a Houthi stronghold in that in the capital and so since his um you know uh killing uh, some members of his party remained in in this coalition government with the Houthis others have joined forces with the coalition and began you know posing a different front um to the Houthis but they still remained in control of most of the most populous area in Yemen. Um, nothing has really changed very much on the ground since July of 2015. The southern part of the country, historic south, and some areas in the north are controlled by the coalition government, but that basically means, you know, Saudi influence, UAE occupied areas, uh, and then southern separatists who have different goals from Ye Yemenis who are on their side um, but don't want to secede from the north. They're still trying to retake the north. And so there have been clashes within those groups themselves. And you have like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and some ISIS groups in the south. So the south is completely, you know, fragmented among all of these different political parties, whereas the north is really only controlled by Ansarullah. This is Letters on Politics. We are in conversation with Shireen Al-Adimi non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and assistant professor of language and literacy at Michigan State University's College of Education. She joins us for a conversation about the history of Yemen and, and who are the Houthis. So let me ask that. Who, who are the Houthis? How, how do you describe to people who the Houthis are? I think for a lot of people, especially considering most recent events, with the attacks against ships in the Red Sea and the United States response and military attacks against Yemen. Um, how, how do you describe to people who the Houthis are? Well, they're often described as Iran-backed Houthi rebels. And I think um, those are just euphemisms for enemy, right? Because here in the, in the U.S., in the West, we're conditioned to think about Iran as the great enemy. And so it's easy for people to understand, oh, yeah, these are the bad guys. In Yemen, of course, they're not seen that way. Uh, their relationship with Iran has been exaggerated. Um, they're an autonomous group. They are Yemenis who initially began, uh, the movement began by this the Houthi family in northern Yemen, in Saada province, which uh, borders Saudi Arabia. And they were a family of preachers and politicians. They formed a political party. They were, you know, they had membership in parliament for a while. Um, and they were speaking out very uh, consistently and vocally. And again, that's a dangerous to, thing to do under a dictatorship. Uh, but they were speaking out against Saudi Abdullah Saleh's relationship with the West and with Saudi Arabia and against Saudi religious influence in Yemen, because Yemen has a long history of uh, Zaydi Shia traditions and uh, Sunni Shafi traditions. Um, and yet we saw the in influence of Salafi Wahhabi Islam from Saudi Arabia in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, uh, that was deteriorating the theological fabric in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And so they were speaking out against that. And, is, this being um, brought in, is this being brought in from Saudi Arabia, Wahhabi Yeah, it's being brought in from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was exporting this version of Islam to, you know, to the masses, essentially, to people in Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan and Yemen. Um, and maybe there wasn't as much resistance to this in other places, but in Yemen, like I said, we have a very long history of coexisting as Zaydis and Shafi's, Sunnis and Shias. Um, and so there was this was a threat to Yemeni identity and Yemeni society, especially when this ideology was, um, you know, many don't see as being compatible with these with these other traditions at all. It's a very extreme version of uh, of Islam that you see taken up by people like who belong to Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban and whatnot. And Yemenis were very resistant to that. Um, but the Houthis themselves, they belong to the sect of Zaydi Islam, like I said, but they're not a minority by any means. 40% of the Yemeni population follows that sect of Islam. The president Saleh himself followed that sect of Islam. He was a secular man, but he was a member of the Zaydi um, community. And so this isn't an issue of a sectarian divide among Yemenis. Uh, it's not an issue of like the small minority that is not representing the, you know, the interests of the larger population, but they were most vocal against U.S. intervention in Yemen, U.S. influence in Yemen and Saudi influence in Yemen. And Saleh saw that as a threat. And so he responded by enlisting Saudi support to um, 
to battle them militarily. He said, look, they're at your border. They're a threat to you as much as they are to me. They call you an enemy. They think of me as an enemy. You really should help me out here. And they did. He tried doing the same with the U.S. at the time by creating this uh, link between them and Iran, saying that he, and this is all in WikiLeaks if people want to go down the rabbit hole, but I think it's worthwhile, um, you know, uh, saying that they are funded by Iran, that their weapons that they were using against the Yemeni government were, you know, transferred by Iran. And the Americans took this seriously because, like I said, Iran, USA, long-term enemies. And so um, they were willing to support him if that were true. But the investigations showed that they were actually getting their weapons from the Yemeni market, the Yemeni black market. And so they weren't, you know, agents of Iran. Um, they've gone closer to Iran as the war dragged on. Uh, but they're certainly autonomous. They're indigenous to Yemen. They have, they're a product of the local conditions there in Yemen. Um, and the response to them, military military response to them, only made them stronger over time. The Zaydi sect of Islam, this is, I, I suppose, under the umbrella of of, of uh, the, the Shiite track of the religion? It is, um, but it's also theologically closer to Sunni Islam. Um, because the 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 schism with the when we say Shia Islam now, most Shia Muslims follow the sect that's practiced in like Iraq and Lebanon and and uh, Iran, which is the Twelver um, sect, the Jafari school of thought. Um, the Zaydis split very early on, and so they didn't have they don't follow the twelve imams the way the majority of the Shias do. They follow five imams, the last of whom his name was Zaid, and so hence Zaydi Islam. Uh, but theologically, they're closer to Sunnis, while and I think that's why they were allowed to, and and maybe not that's why, but that's one of the reasons they were able to coexist with their Sunni neighbors with no issues for fifteen hundred years. Um, but they are. Um, they don't think of themselves necessarily as Sunni or Shia. They think of themselves as Zaydi. And the Zaydi sect of Islam only really exists in Yemen. So a little bit different than I think is commonly portrayed in the media today that, the relation, that there's this relig strong religious connection between Yemen and Iran. Yeah, there isn't. I mean, there's a geopolitical interest. There's a, a relation. I mean, they found themselves being bombed and uh, starved by uh, most of their neighbors. And they found an ally in Iran. Um and Iran does support them with various, you know, maybe technological ways, maybe some weapons, but not to the same extent that the Saudis were receiving, you know, or the other side, the other Yemenis were receiving support from the Saudi-led coalition in the U.S. To say they're Iran-backed, I think, just gives us the notion that they're controlled by Iran and they're certainly not controlled. And many people have been saying this, just hearing those analyses are just preposterous because it betrays a true ignorance of the situation in Yemen. Uh, and at the very least, just a nefarious attempt to um, dismiss them as just, you know, proxies of Iran. Could the Houthis be considered a religious fundamental fundamentalist group? Um, they're not calling for a theology, a uh, theological state. They are still operating within the Republic of Yemen. They are cannot be compared to uh, extremist groups like the Taliban or ISIS or Al-Qaeda by any means. And their concerns have always been nationalists. So... Um, this was a call for sovereignty. This was a their 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 protest at the very beginning, and their fight now is one of national sovereignty. They have no interest in ex you know in repression, like you know, or control in that sense, or imposing a religious doctrine. Although that may come with them becoming the de facto rulers, we'll see. Um, but you know. They also, like I said, 40% of Yemeni society is already Zaydi. And so they're not trying to convert people to Zaydi Islam. They're just trying to stave off foreign intervention. Uh, but I think it remains to be seen what kind of government they will have. I hope it's one that's democratic. I hope it's that Yemenis can actually, you know, decide their own future because this was what they've been attempted to do all along. Yemen is a republic. Um, we're not... A monarchy like our neighbors are we're not absolute monarchies tell me the significance of that yemen yemen is a republic there is a long um so tip of the arabian peninsula is surrounded by gulfs the gulf of aden in the south the red sea in the west oman to our east which is a sultanate 
uh, Saudi Arabia to the north, which is a an absolute monarchy. And then all of the countries within that Gulf, the Arabian Gulf Peninsula, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, UAE, and like I said, Oman and Saudi Arabia, all of them are absolute monarchies. Yemen is the only one in that entire region that is not. And um, when there was a monarchy in Yemen, in northern Yemen, in the between 1918 and the early 60s, Yemenis fought long and hard to expel them, to expel that system of monarchy. And they actually found, the monarchy found support from Saudi Arabia at the time in order to maintain its power. So for eight years, the Saudis and the British supported the North Yemeni Zaydi monarchy um, to try to remain in power because if you're a king, you want a king at your borders. You don't want a democracy at your borders trying to maybe uh, influence your people in any way, shape or form. And so the motivations of Saudi Arabia have always been to try to maintain if we're not going to get a monarchy in Yemen, we've tried that in the 60s. Well, at least we can get a puppet in government who uh, will serve our interests as long as well as his. And that's the panic that we saw in 2015 when they realized that that wasn't going to be the case anymore with the formation of a government that would have included the Houthis. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that there's a spirit for democracy. And if the Houthis end up becoming dictators, I bet you anything that the Yemeni population is going to rise up once again and, um, you know, call for uh, an independent, you know, republic democratic state because that is the promise that has yet to be fulfilled has in Yemen. Could it be described as a republic for now has been put on hold in the sense of how it operates? Um, I would say so. I mean, there's not been any, we can't have elections at this time when there's an act of war. Um, there were going to be elections in 2014 that, or 20, 2012, 2013, 2014, that they kept, you know, moving those elections um, president Hadi was in power as an interim president for a while, but he was only appointed for two years. Within those two years, he was supposed to call for elections and he kept, you know, postponing that, asked for another extension, resigned, was, you know, basically wasting everybody's time. Um, and meanwhile, there was a plot to essentially federalize Yemen into these several federa uh, federal groups. And the Houthis resisted that because it was just going to fracture. It's just going to be another attempt by foreign powers to divide and conquer. Um, and so I, I would say that, you know, it's yet to be seen, but the hope is for um, the people of Yemen to decide what's best for them. And hopefully that happens in a democratic way. Last week, U.S. President Joe Biden redesignated the Houthis as a terrorist organization early on in his term as president. He undid that designation of the Houthis being a terrorist organization. What, how, how do you see that dynamic in the United States with these terrorist designations about the Houthis? Biden and his administration criticized Trump for using this as a political tool back in 2021. So one of the last acts uh, as president, uh, in, in one of his ask, last acts as president, he Trump designated the Houthis as uh, terrorists, largely in response to the UAE saying, hey, look at these guys, they've been like bombing us, as though Yemenis are not supposed to, you know, as though Yemenis have no right to self-defense, that we were just supposed to lay down and take it while a coalition of 16 countries was bombing us. Um, and so he designated them as terrorists. And very quickly, the Biden administration um, reversed that. It was actually the quickest reversal of an FTO in, in the U.S., um, because he saw that as a political tool. And uh, Blinken at the time said that, oh, we've listened, quote unquote, we've listened to the United Nations warnings and other humanitarian groups. And we know that this is going to affect the Yemeni population adversely. Um, we don't see them as terrorists and we're going to delist them. So now to now reinstate them uh, is essentially doing what Trump did, which is using it as a political tool, except that, I, I mean, Trump did it and, you know, and he was leaving office. He just did it to placate the UAE. Um, but Biden is doing it to get them to stop the attacks in the Red Sea when he knows that the only thing that's going to stop the attacks in the Red Sea is calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, actually having a ceasefire in Gaza, lifting the blockade on Gaza, which is what the Ansarullah have said that is, are, is behind the motivation for these attacks. Um, and during the short ceasefire, there were no attacks in the Red Sea because, you know, that they said they weren't going to attack when there is a ceasefire. So... 
Um, I think it just represents another, you know, political game that this Biden administration is playing. And he knows that this is going to starve Yemenis because what financial institution is going to want to operate in an area that's controlled by quote unquote terrorists. Um, and so those of us sending money back home in order to make sure that people are alive, how are we going to be able to send this money back home? How remittances are a large part of the Yemeni economy, unfortunately, because of the um because of the um, um, the poverty that Yemenis have experienced as a result of the war over the last several years. So, you know, how are aid organizations supposed to operate in those areas? Um, it, he knows what the consequences are, not to the Houthis, but to the Yemeni population. The Houthis don't really have a lot of funds outside for him to sanction. This is not going to affect them. It's going to affect the average Yemeni person, just like the war and the blockade over the last nine years has affected the average Yemeni person at the end. There has been a famine. Oh, Yemen? absolutely. Um, I mean, they've called it famine-like conditions, but we know a child was dying of starvation. A child under five, the age of five was dying of starvation every 75 seconds for many years in Yemen. Uh, nobody sat down and calculated all of these costs of war. The It feels like they just stopped counting at some point. But, you know, the most conservative estimate is that 377,000 people were killed in this war, either by starvation or bombing. Um, we know that the figures are much larger. You know, anybody who... Um, needed dialysis and couldn't get, get access to that because of the blockade. 50% of the population had no access to hospitals or healthcare services because most of our hospitals were bombed. And then, you know, getting medical aid and supplies into the country was impossible because of the blockade. Um, cholera was running rampant in Yemen. The worst case, the worst outbreak in modern history happened in Yemen because there was no fuel in the country to operate the water pumps. People were drinking contaminated water couldn't rehydrate with water because there was no way to gain access to clean water and they were dying of preventable diseases like cholera and diphtheria and whatnot. Uh, all of the people who died, all of the children who died of a fever because there was no Tylenol on the shelves, for example, those don't get counted as casualties of war, but they absolutely have been casualties of war, let alone the people who literally starved to death. And we were seeing these images of people starving to death because there was no food allowed to come into the country unless it was authorized by the Saudi-led coalition. There have been charges of genocide uh, about concerning what's happening in Yemen. Do, do you, the legal term of genocide is a deliberate attempt to um, eliminate in part or in whole an entire people. Do, do you see that as ha having had happened or even still happening in Yemen? Absolutely. And I think the parallel I'm going to draw here is that the case against Israel in um, the ICJ, you know, parallels the case against um, or, you know, there's no case against them. But these um, the statements that we hear the Israelis make about Palestinians are they parallel the the case that this the statements that the Saudis were making against Yemenis. So, you know, Israel says that they're not blockading uh, Palestinians they are blocking Hamas. Saudi Arabia said for a number of years, they're not blockading Yemenis, they're blockading the Houthis. Okay, well, Yemenis were dying, Houthis are not. Um, they were saying that the Houthis were using civilians as shields, as human shields, just like we hear Israel say about Palestinians who are being killed, civilians, and they say that they were just human shields being used by Hamas. Um, they were saying that they're not targeting, you know, anything deliberately. Uh, meanwhile, you know, hospitals and schools and school buses and any any moving vehicle, essentially, and homes and mosques and all of these areas, uh, historic, even our historic heritage sites, they were all deliberately targeted by the Saudi-led coalition. So if it's not genocide, then what is it? Um, they declared war upon the entire population of Yemen, those in those areas that um, didn't support them, that didn't accept foreign intervention. And they worked really hard. And, you know, we know from UN reports, for example, that their targeting was widespread and systematic. And yet the U.S. continued to support them, not just with weapons, but with targeting assistance and logistics and spare parts and all of the ways that we mentioned earlier. Shreen al is our guest. Shreen al is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and assistant professor of language and literacy at Michigan State University's College of Education. She joins us for a conversation about the history of Yemen and who are the Houthis. Shreen al what what interest? what is the interest that Saudi Arabia has in Yemen? I've been saying this for a number of years and people have said, well, it's actually not that important, but we see the importance now, which is Bab al-Mandab Strait, first and foremost. Bab al-Mandab Strait is where international shipping goes through. Anything going to Asia from Europe, anything going to Europe from Asia has to go through Bab al-Mandab Strait. 
And whoever controls Yemen controls Bab el Mandeb Strait. And so the battles there have been most fierce over the last several years as well. And so, yes, there are some oil reserves and gas reserves and whatnot, but the main interest here is Yemen's geopolitical location and the you know, the ability of whoever's governing Yemen to potentially disrupt international shipping in that strait. And the Houthis have never posed a, a threat to international shipping. They don't even pose a threat to international shipping now. They pose a threat to shipping um, to Israel's economy, essentially, because they've targeted all Israel-linked and Israel-bound ships. After the U.S. and U.K. started bombing Yemen, they said that they've expanded that to also U.S. and U.K. linked ships in that area. But I think we see now that the geopolitical location um, and the ability for Yemen's rulers to disrupt that is what got Saudi Arabia and the UA and the UAE and the U.S. involved in Yemen to begin with. Um, they underplayed that for a number of years, but that's why Yemen has always been the target of those countries. And they've maintained good relationships with the dictators there in order to ensure that, you know, that Saudi oil going through these ports is not going to be disrupted. And that, you know, you don't want instability at your border either when you're Saudi Arabia. And so that was the other reason they wanted to maintain control and have a thumb over um, whoever's going to be leading Yemen. This strait, it's a part of the Red Sea? It's a part of the Red Sea. It's just at the entrance of the Red Sea. Yemen is at that corner of between the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. And uh, it controls, it's a very tight passageway. It's actually the name translate to Gate of Tears because historically so many people died crossing those straits. It's a very, very narrow strait. Um, and so, you know, they've they've controlled it. And there has been some, so in the 60s, for example, the communist country, the communist uh, government in South Yemen, in a show of solidarity, solidarity with um, the Egyptians in their war against Israel, um, they closed Bab el Mandeb tra- Strait for a while. So people know the U.S. knows, the Saudis know that this strait is very important, and uh, whoever is in charge of Yemen controls that strait, and so it better be somebody who is a strong ally of Saudi Arabia and the UAE and and the United States. And it's important to understand the Red Sea itself and the importance that the Red Sea holds. This is a long body of water that's connected to other body of waters that can actually serve as a shortcut from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. And without being able to go through this, 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 these bodies of water, you would actually have to sail all the way south around the continent of Africa. So it's, it's a vitally important body of water. I think it's multiple bodies of water, right? Also includes Mediterranean Sea. And I, I'm a little yep. geographically challenged, but... Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, you don't want to add, if you're a shipping company, you don't want to add 9 to 14 days to your journey uh, by going through the tip of Africa, right? Um, and that comes with extra fuel, extra costs. Um, and, you know, this is a shortcut, like you said. And so it's vitally important to shipping, to um, to international shipping, to oil, uh, you know, whether it's oil and oil products going through these ports. And by last last time I checked, it was something like six or seven million barrels of oil and, you know, oil products go through that port every single um, day. And so uh, they just want to make sure that that is not disrupted. The shipping is not disrupted. And the response of the United States to act as a world police once again and to deploy troops and the Navy in that area, in Yemen's own backyard, in Yemeni waters, and to say that they're defending capitalism, essentially by calling it Operation Prosperity Guardian. That's just a clear out defense of capitalism. They're not even hiding it. Um, when all they had to do was not support a genocide in Palestine, in Gaza. Um, and then to begin bombing Yemen and to call it Houthi targets as though airports are Houthi targets, you know, and not, it don't belong to the Yemeni people. Um, and so to escalate in that way, rather than to work toward a diplomatic solution and to call for peace in that region, I think just tells us what the intentions of the United States are and the violent response that we're seeing to this conflict. Operation Prosperity Garden. That's what they called it. Who comes up with these? The United States, apparently. Tell, tell me, you, you know, there's many countries that border the Red Sea, 
and and even and, and even other bodies of water that gives you the route from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. Only Yemen and the Houthis in Yemen are attacking U.S. ships and Israeli ships for their claim of in solidarity. I, I don't know in solidarity, but due to what is happening in Gaza, why 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 only Yemen? What, what's important to understand about this dynamic? What's important to understand is that um, many of these countries are um, strong allies of the United States. They don't represent the will of their own people. Large, by and large, Arab populations are against the state of Israel and against the state of Israel certainly committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, we, we see it on our phones every single day and it's absolutely horrific. And the um, Arab countries in that region have not been able to mobilize in any way, shape, or form, you know, to put any kind of pressure to for Israel to stop its um, bombardment and its attack on civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> the Houthis have no relationship with the United States and Israel, have no intention to normalize relationships with Israel, as we've seen happen with many of these Arab countries. So um, the UAE, for example, just normalized relationships, their economic relationship with Israel, the Saudis were very close to a normalization deal with Israel. None of this has to do with the Palestinian people. They've done it, in fact, at the expense of Palestinian people, as though Saudi and Israel were ever at war. You know, they weren't. Um, but they're, you know, furthering their own economic interests through these normalization deals, and so they don't want to disrupt that. And they've allowed the U.S. and U.K. to use their airspaces to bomb Yemen in response. And so this, these are not people who could be seen as serious in their solidarity with Palestine and the Palestinians. Um, you've seen uh, clashes with Hezbollah and some um, clashes out of Iraq. But other than that, the Houthis represent the... They're, they're not the rulers of Yemen, but they're essentially they're the de facto government in northern Yemen, whether they're recognized by the international community or not. They are the de facto government in Yemen um, and they pose the biggest threat here. But I think they stand the spotlight is on them because of the silence of all of the regional um, players uh, right now. And it's a shameful silence. It doesn't have to be done this way, you know, like if the Saudis, for example, limited oil production just for a week. We could see what kind of impact that would happen, that would have on uh, Israel's and certainly the U.S. support for Israel. Um, instead, they just make these statements that are um, empty statements, and they're just they just essentially through their silence are um, supporting whatever is happening in Palestine. And so, um, why are they the only ones? I, I don't know. I would love to see. It would have been it would have been important to see solidarity, material solidarity for Palestine emerge from these other countries. But I know that the reality is that they don't represent the will of their people. These are dictators and and you know kings who have controlled um, their region and who have they don't even have a constitution in Saudi Arabia, for example. These are absolute monarchies, and their relationship with Saudi their relationship with the West, with the UK, with the US, with Israel is far more important than any kind of solidarity they would have for the Palestinian people. Is, is there a historic relationship between Yemen and Palestine? There is. Um, so Yemen, like I've said, like we've talked about today, you know, it's been divided north and south. We had a monarchy in the north at some point, the communists in the south, and a republic of Yemen. And yet through all of these various um, government forms, we've had moral and material support for Palestinians and the Palestinian cause. So one example is when the when Yemen, northern Yemen, when it was still a monarchy, um, they joined the UN. They were in 1947. They were among five countries that walked out of the UN meeting when they voted to partition Palestine. Um, when in the 60s, there was a war between Egypt and Israel. The communists in, North, in South Yemen closed Bab al Mandeb in solidarity with Palestine. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, during the Lebanese Civil War and other events in that region, when the Palestinian leadership was kicked out of uh, Lebanon, they were welcomed with open arms by Ali Abdullah Saleh, the pr 
president. And so no matter what system we've had in power and government in Yemen, there's always been material and moral support to the Palestinian people. Even growing up in Yemen, I had Palestinian neighbors who, you know, they were, their parents were teachers and they could work and live in Yemen without any kind of restrictions that Palestinians face in other countries, you know, no refugee camps or anything like that. Um, there was a deep more solidarity with the Palestinian people throughout the decades. And I think part of that is because, you know, we mentioned Yemen as the homeland of Arabs. And so there's a sense of Arab nationalism and pan-Arabism there. Um, but also, you know, we are a colonized people. We know what that looks like. We know the consequences of that. And we, we know oppression when we see it because we've experienced it. And so there's this um, long running solidarity with the Yemeni people that you're seeing now manifest through Houthi leadership and the vast support by the Yemeni people for these actions. You've seen, I don't, I don't know if your viewers have or your listeners have seen the masses in Yemen who've come out in support of these um, actions in the Red Sea and in defiance of the US-UK bombings against them. Um, we're talking millions of people being mobilized in the streets. These people are not forced to be there. They are showing their genuine support for the Palestinians. In the Arab world, does Yemen hold a special place? to people for it, it, the significance, I mean, maybe of even what's happening right now, especially on the street, but I, but even historically speaking for its significance in, in early Arab history? I would say that um, we've kind of been sidelined by many in the Arab world as uh, and looked down upon, uh, frankly, as being, uh, you know, quote unquote, the poorest middle country in the Middle East, as though we weren't exploited and, you know, uh, made impoverished by the various um, events that happened. But there's this, uh, and even if we were, like, so what, you know. Um, but I think they've been dismissed for quite a while. When the Saudis began bombing in Yemen in 2015, there was very little support for the Yemeni population. Since 2015 to 2023, there has not been, like, this, you know, mobilization for our cause. You don't see these protests in the Arab world in solidarity of Yemen. Um, it felt like we were just yelling into the void for all of these years, trying to get people to pay attention to what's happening in Yemen and to stop their own governments from bombing us. There wasn't it wasn't a, a call for help. It was a call for ending hostilities, ending these, whether it was the U.S.'s influence in bombing in Yemen or the U.K. support for it or the Saudi or UAE. But we didn't have that mass mobilization. Um, on the streets or politically or otherwise in support of Yemenis. Um, and so we felt, and many Yemenis have felt, absolutely ignored by the rest of the world and by our Arab neighbors who ganged up on us essentially um, when we posed no threat to their security whatsoever. Um, but I think what's happening now is that they're seeing, all of a sudden we're seeing this attention on, uh, on Sadullah and their actions in Yemen. and. Many in the Arab world are are understand this to be uh, a legitimate response to genocide. So the Houthis are saying that they are enacting their duties under the Genocide Convention, Article 1, prevention of genocide, the state's duties to prevent genocide. And many people are seeing this as a righteous form of resistance to what's happening in Palestine. Um, and there's a lot more attention to the Yemen cause now than we've seen in the last several years. Um, I don't know how sustained this will be, but in this moment, there's a perceptible shift in how Yemenis are being seen by their neighbors, who for the longest time either accepted that they were just going to be bombed or just you know didn't really care that much. Or if they did, there wasn't any sustained mobilization uh, in solidarity with Yemenis. So they are citing the Geneva Convention for the justification of are. these attacks yes. in the Red Sea. And, and that, that reminds me, in the 1990s when the Houthis are formed, they, they were an anti-corruption. It was an anti-corruption movement, wasn't it? I mean, I think it's easy for us, especially if we don't know a lot about it, myself included, to think of this as a theocratic kind of a group, and, and maybe there's some elements of that. But, but it's also a very sort of legal-minded anti-corruption group, at least in its origins. It was anti-corruption, anti-imperialist, anti-interventionist group. Um, and those were very clearly what they were calling for from the beginning. And it's what made so many people in Yemen um, join their cause. You know, they're no longer just the Houthis or Ansarullah um, because 
Yemenis, regardless of their sectarian affiliation, whether they're or regional affiliation, um, you know, are joining, have joined the front lines and have joined in many ways the cause of the Ansarullah, because these are things that affected all of us in Yemen, just most people weren't able to say anything about it. Now, of course, along the years, they've been accused of human rights violations. And I do think that every violation of human rights needs to be investigated thoroughly by outside neutral parties. Um, and I'm not saying that the Houthis have acted, you know, in a way that um, gained support from every Yemeni. That's not the case. But I think if there were elections in Yemen today, I think they would win ha hands down um, because of the grievances that they have and the, the way that they've been seen as defending Yemen over the last several years in defiance of Saudi Arabia and the UAE and now directly in defiance of the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, they're seen as people who are in Yemen, defending Yemen against foreign intervention, foreign aggression, and have called against corruption and are, um, you know, their cause is rooted in, in those grievances. Shireen Al-Adimi has been our guest. She has joined us for a conversation about the history of Yemen and who are the Houthis. Shireen Al-Adimi is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and assistant professor of language and literacy at Michigan State University's College of Education. Shireen Aladimi, I, I thank you very much for taking this time. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Mitch.